right, today we're going to continue along the lines of updating and uh, updating the database and we're going to look at more of how to tweak the default behaviors. Um, if you remember from last time, the default behaviors are pretty boring, are pretty um, rudimentary. Um, it's possible that in some cases they would be adequate, but it's not likely. All right. Um, if you recall, in a details view, and the same thing applies to a grid view, by the way. Just about everything I'm saying about a details view applies to a grid view as well. You can, you can set update mode on a grid view as well. Um, the default is, is that when you're in read-only mode or view mode or however one you want to put it, it shows you the text and labels, all right? When you go into edit mode, it shows you the text in text boxes. That's it. No validation, uh, no drop-downs, no anything. Well, again, for some very rudimentary tables, that might be adequate, but it's probably not going to be adequate for too many, um, too many situations. So what we have is we have what are called template columns, and template columns are simply a way to tweak the default behavior to make it work the way that we want to. I talked about this um, last time and probably the time before that when you're working with a framework, you know, the framework is going to do things a certain way. That might be good for you, that might not be good for you. It might serve your needs, it might not serve your needs. It might sort of serve your needs. Your job is to decide what you're going to do then. All right? Um, and your choices are pretty much, A, live with it. Gee, this doesn't do exactly what I want it to do, but you know what? I got bigger fish to fry, so I'm not going to worry about that. At least not worry about that right now. That would be one option. And I will say the teacher in me doesn't like that option, right? Because... We should do the best job that we can all the time and do everything as well as we can. All right? That's the teacher in me. The former programmer in me says, well, yeah, but come on now. Deadlines are deadlines. You know, um, Why spin your wheels working on something that only is going to provide a small benefit? Um, it's, it's not worth the time and effort involved in some cases. So live with it would be one possibility. Another possibility would be to scrap the framework and do it yourself. All right? And a third possibility is figuring out how to tweak the framework. And usually frameworks give you a hook into which you can go to tweak them. And in the case of details views and grid views, that hook is a template column. And that template column allows you to go in and customize what um, the templates, be, or not the template, but the... Uh, framework's behavior is. So we did that last time with our uh, summer league example and we went and we made it such that um, when someone logs on they go into edit mode for their personal information. So now when you log on, you go directly to the screen to edit it. That was sort of a tweak because the default behavior of the framework is to take you into read-only mode, and then you'd have to click edit if you wanted to edit it. But in this case, we say, well, we probably want to go directly into edit mode, save a click. successfully.
Uh, see if, if my law was into effect, I'd have been able to play a quick round of Tetris while it was waiting for that to fire off. But, all right. Again, the default behavior is to simply put everything in a text box. Actually, the default default behavior is to first go into read-only mode. We change that by going in and changing the default mode to edit mode. And we further change that by adding a validator. So if we go to up, up, uh, update it and we don't have a field there, it gives us an error. All right. Now notice after we click update, it stays there. There's probably another thing we might want to tweak. All right, because it's like, well, yeah, I just updated you. Why are you letting me update you again? You know, we probably want to go somewhere else. All right, so that's another thing that we probably want to address. Um, other things, password. We probably would not want the password to be visible. All right. Um, we're going to add at least one field, maybe a couple <coughs> fields, depending on time. Um, but like, let's say if there's a skill level that should match one of the skills in the skill table. All right. So all these things are things where we deviate from the default. And all that's going to be accomplished by templates. Now, let's go back to the login page. I kind of like to set the path of where we're going to, and then we'll get there. So let's go to the default page, and let's log in as DH. Okay, let's check to see what those user IDs are. you know which letter I was missing? <laughs> Can you hear the difference in the keys? I mean... I, I know it no, I saw what you were typing and when you hit the second to last one, nothing showed up. Alright, there we go. Some systems you don't allow someone to change that. But 
we could let's let's assume we want to allow them to change their user ID. Well, we would have to. We couldn't. Could we put validation on the text box? Not validation that would run client side. That's for sure, right? Because the client side doesn't have access to the database to go out and see did they enter that. Could we use a drop down? No. Could we use a drop down that would show what? Everything that wasn't in the database to allow them to make a selection? <laughs> that, that doesn't make sense, right? So we're going to have to go about validation a different way in this case. And we could do it one of two ways. All right. I feel like I'm saying that a million times today. You can do that one of two ways. All right. One way is we could actually write code that says before you update, go and see if there's a person that has this user ID exist. All right. And if they are, we throw up an error message. If not, we let them change it. That's one option. Second option is let them try. Just catch the error if it happens and display an error in a more user-friendly way. And oftentimes, that's the better approach to take. <clears throat> All right? And in that way, you don't have to anticipate every potential error and write massive code to do this. Right? If you think about it, most of the time, if someone's going to edit their information, they're probably not going to be changing their user ID. And therefore, why add that extra overhead of checking every time someone goes and does an update if they've changed their user ID? Let it try. And if it fails, boom, then you display a user-friendly message. Again, that's not the default behavior, so it's something we're going to have to tweak. All right, let's look at our code to make sure we understand the basics, and then revisit a little bit about templates, and then go on from there. First of all, and we're going to look at the going to look at this through the GUI and through the code view. As you might imagine, following the philosophy that we've done so far, the data source is one thing, the visual representation of it is another. We should be able to change one within reason without necessarily affecting the other. So when we added update capability to this, we had to change both the details view and we had to change the SQL data source. SQL data source, how did we change it? Well, we added an update statement. And let me post that in the notepad. So we can take a closer look at it. Or Notepad++. Plus plus. Our update statements look like this. Update the name of the table, then the word set. Following the word set are pairs of column names equaling a value. Now in our case, we can't hard code any values here, right? We have to use the question mark. And the question mark means it's going to come from a parameter that is supplied at runtime. There's a comma after each of these pairs until you get down to the very last one. There's no comma after that. Lastly, we have a where clause. Without a where clause, it would try to update every single person in the database, which is clearly not something that we would want to do. Typically, in the code we're doing, in the kinds of things we're doing, our updates are going to be updating one particular row in the database. And therefore, by definition, we want to use a primary key for that, because the primary key uniquely identifies a row in the database. Any questions about this set statement? Or, I'm sorry, update statement. Now again, what, would, what could possibly go wrong with this? What could go wrong is if our update statement caused the database 
or, or try to update data which would cause a violation of the constraints that are in the database. Let's go and look at what constraints are in the database for this table. We only have one table, so it should be pretty straightforward. First name we have to find is a required field. So if we try to supply a player without a first name, it's going to give us an error. Last name is not required. It probably should be, right? Well, no, because we'd want, we'd want to allow Madonna and Prince and, and those folks to be able to play in our league. So maybe we just have a first name. Email address is not required. User ID is required, as is user password. And user ID, what's more, has a unique index on it. It's indexed, and it does not permit duplicates. Remember, that's what you do in the case of a candidate key. What's a candidate key? A candidate key is another field that could serve the role as the primary key. In other words, yeah, you can make the user ID the primary key. We chose not to, and we chose not to for a couple reasons. First of all, numeric is typically better than text, all right, as far as the size of the, the field that you're storing. Because um, remember, we're not just storing it in this table, we're storing it in all the related tables. Um, we might want to allow them to change user IDs. Um, generally speaking, while not impossible, you want to avoid changing the primary key of tables. And so because of that, although we could use this, it's probably a better bet to use the player ID, which is auto number and auto generated. Okay, so if any of these constraints are violated, then we're going to get an error on this update statement. Oddly enough, if we supplied an invalid player ID, um, we would not get an error. It simply would not update anything. Right? So if I said update player set f name equals this, blah, 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 where player ID equals 9999999, all right, and we don't have that in our database, then we wouldn't get an error. All right, it simply wouldn't update anything. So that's sort of a tip off to you, a troubleshooting tip, is if you're trying to do an update and A, you don't get an error, but B, your data isn't updated, then you're probably your where clause is wrong. All right, and you're probably trying to update the wrong thing. You think you're trying to update this this row in the database, but you're actually trying to update something else. Okay. We actually, if we go through the 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 GUI generation of, of that, we can have we can have SQL or we can have uh, Visual Studio generate the update statement too. Again, you gotta be careful though, because it might not generate it correctly. Yeah, you probably should look and double check that. All right, that's the changes we make to the data source. The changes we make to the details view is, first of all, we enable editing. All right. That option wasn't available before because the data source didn't have an update statement. So no sense letting them try to uh, edit it if we haven't supplied the, the statement that actually does the update. All right. That's all we really needed to do. That's, all that, that's not all that we're going to do, but that's all that we really absolutely needed to do. So what else did we do? Well, first of all, we changed the default mode of this to edit. So it pops right into edit mode. If you remember last time, the default was read only. So it displayed the row. Then it said, you know, you had to click edit to go into edit mode. Well, that really doesn't make sense here. So what we're going to do is um, automatically pop them into edit mode. The other thing that we changed is 
we converted one of the columns into a template column. What does that mean? That means that we don't like the default behavior and we want to write our own behavior one way or another for it. And in this case, the, the field we didn't like the default behavior for was the first name. And so I went in for first name and converted it to a template field. Now that it's a template field, I can go and edit templates. And I actually can edit templates, the item template, which is a read-only template, alternating item. The one that we're interested in, edit item template, where we can put in, in this case, a validation. Now, in other cases, we might put a drop-down or whatever. But in this case, we put a validation in there. All right. Remember, we could not put that validation outside of the details view. Because that text box for entering name doesn't exist all the time on our page. It only exists when we're in edit mode. So there's really nothing to tie our validator control with unless we put the validator control inside here. All right. OK. Our next thing that we're going to do, we're going to add a skill level to our, ta uh, to our to, we're going to add a table for it, and we're going to add um, uh, a, a, a table to contain the skill levels. Now, this is one thing that some students are resistant on. They will say something like, couldn't I, couldn't I just put validation, let's say if there's three skill levels, you know, beginner, intermediate, and expert. Couldn't I just put a validation in, on my page that would say, well, it has to be between one and three. You could, but what's wrong with that? Well, what if we add another field, all right? Um, the other thing is, remember, it's always better to put the constraint in the database as opposed to having your application um, enforce it. So you could develop this and put in a validation to make sure that the skill level was one, two, or three. Someone accessing the same database but writing a mobile app for it, all right, which you certainly could do, right? Someone accessing the database and writing a mobile app to do this update might not realize that the skill level is something that has to be one, two, or three, and therefore not put the proper validation in it. Again, if the constraint is built on the database level, we don't have to worry about that because it doesn't matter how you try to get the data in, the database constraints will be in effect and will prevent bad data from being entered. So when we can, we want to put the constraints in the database. All right? That way they can't put in 99 as a skill level. Or they can't type in the word expert or EXP or BEG or BGNR or whatever for beginner or expert. They're limited and they have to put it in a, in a consistent manner. So I think sometimes it's a little bit of laziness on students' faults to not want to put in these code tables. But it really isn't that much more work and I know I said as a programmer it's good to be lazy in some senses. That's when you have inspired laziness, when you have laziness that causes you to write things more efficiently. In this case, you're simply trying to save time sort of version of laziness, which isn't necessarily what we're after here. So because of that, I'm going to go in and I'm going to make a table. probably going to have to close out of this because it might not let me. So I'm going to go in here, I'm going to create table. Go into design view. And I'm going to call it skill level. Now, a lot of these tables are going to look almost the same. 
They're going to have a primary key, which is generated. All right. And then they're going to have like a description. Now, in some cases, they might have more than that. But in some cases, that's all they'll have. So, for example, if we had a type of student here at Lorain County Community College and our choices were in county, out of county, out of state. All right. That may be all that we had in the table is the code or I'm sorry, the ID and a description of the ID. One means in county, two means out of county, three means out of state. But we could have more, right? We could have in addition to the code and the description, we could have, for example, the tuition rate that said that, well, in county students get charged X per credit hour, out county students get charged some other value and so on. Or like if we had departments, if we had departments in the database um, here, we could just have the ID and the code, or we could have like, who's the coordinator for that department? Where's their office? Maybe a more detailed description of the department, other than just a short description. You know, maybe we have computer information systems and we have a longer description that explains exactly what that is. So you might have other stuff in the code table, and I sometimes call these code tables, or sometimes they're called lookup tables, because you use them to look up the values that are appropriate for a field. But at the very least, you will have an ID, and a description. Word to the wise. Don't call it DESC. Why not? Descending. DESC indicates descending. All right? And therefore, it's going to see DESC, think that you mean descending, and it's not going to understand what to do. If you ever accidentally use something that is a database reserved word, and how do you know that you've done this? Well, you know you've done this through a couple ways. One way is when your SQL statement is correct and you've checked and double-checked and double-checked to make sure that you have all your columns spelled right and so on. The typical error that you get is something like invalid parameter or something like that. So yeah, check and double-check and make sure it's in. If you've done that, and maybe even you've ran it in Access and it works, all right, and it still doesn't work, then look for things that could be reserved words. So something like password could be a reserved word. DESC could be. And what's the solution there? The solution there is you put the column name in square brackets. So if I had DESC, I would just use DESC in square brackets then. Section, it would be one of those words, yeah. <laughs> uh, order is, is one as well, you know. Uh, trying to think of the ones that typically burn people. Order definitely burns people because they would, you know, you might have an order table, right? And well, yeah, not, not going to work. That, you know, that. When I get around to writing my memoirs, you know, after I'm king and I retire and let someone else take over for it, um, that would be a good list of things. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but, and, and I'll change the wording a little bit, you know, stuff that programmers say, all right? And one of them would be, it worked on, and then fill in the blank, it worked on my machine, you know? It's like, oh, okay, it worked on your machine. That's, that's all it needs to do then, because it's not like everyone else in the world needs to access it and runs it. Everyone just makes an appointment with you and goes and runs your website on your machine. Perfect. All right. So that's, that's one of the top programming cliches. All right. Let's go and populate this table. I actually could put an order level here or a sequence, right? That way I could choose the order in which they appeared. Let's do that. I'm not going to use order. <laughs> 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 
So, I'm doing this because alphabetical order might not be the way that I want it, right? Nor might the order of the key be the order I want it. Let's say, for example, I put in beginner, intermediate, and expert. And after time, I decide I want to have an advanced intermediate. And so I try to slide that between 2 and 3. Well, I can't give something a primary key of 2 and a half, right? So I would put it in, it would get a key of 4, and I would sort of be sunk, right? Because I couldn't put it, I couldn't sort alphabetically because I don't want advanced intermediate to be the top thing on the choice. And then beginner, and then intermediate, then expert, or would be expert, then intermediate. And I can't do it in key uh, um, order either. So sometimes, if you're real specific about the order that you want things in, um, you, you'll define these sequence codes. A brief reminiscence here, and this would have been great if we were using OO technology at the time, but we weren't. One company that I worked for had a very non-intuitive way of grouping their stuff together. All right? Um, as a programmer, I say it's not intuitive. For them, it made perfect sense because it was based on the reporting structure of who reported to who. All right. So they wanted things sorted in a certain order. All right. They wanted things sorted by, um, and I forget the exact details, but region. Like so, like the East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, South, Southwest, and so on. Then they wanted it sorted within region by the division. So like the East Coast uh, region could be um, sorted, uh, maybe New England is first, then the Mid-Atlantic, then the Southeast, then New York area. And, and like none of it was alphabetical, and none of it was primary key, so we had to have like in every table, we had to have these sequence numbers to go in and say, so we could piece it together and we could sort it. In, in, in a way that, that was required. So if you looked at the printout, it would not make any sense to you. There'd be no rhyme or reason for an outside observer why it was done in this order, yet that was the order they wanted it in. It made, it made perfect sense to them because it, the, the, the order mirrored their reporting structure. So anyhow, so sequence code like this is very, very, very common. All right. So let's go in and let's put these skill levels in. And the first one I'll say is beginner. Make that a sequence code of one. Intermediate. Make that a sequence code of 10. And finally, advanced, and make that a sequence, sequence code of 20 or 29. Why did I do 1, 2, 3? Why did I do? Easy insertion. Yeah, so that I could put something in between. If I just went and said, whoa, wait a minute, that's right, I forgot intermediate advanced. I could go intermediate advanced and give it a code of 15. All right. This is an old trick back in the old day when we used punch cards <laughs> in Fortran. And each card had a line number on it. Right? So you line numbered with increments of 10. And so if you, if you needed to put something between line 10 and 20, you made it line 15. That only broke down when you had nine things inserted between 10 and 20, which you deserve the grief for that because you didn't think through your program if you had to insert nine lines of code between two lines originally. Go back and do more design, go more, do more planning if that's the case. All right, so now we have this, and I'm gonna close that. I'm gonna make this a foreign key in this table. We're going to design view and I'm going to add skill level ID and we're going to make it a number. 
Remember, it's a number in this table that matches to an auto number in the other table. So as I add rows to the skill level table, they're one, two, three, four, and so on. The rows in this table is not going to necessarily be sequence one, two, three, four. In other words, whatever the first person is matches up with their skill level. So it's not going to be in the corresponding same order. Does this add the primary key for skill level? No. We have to go into database tools. And we have to connect this. Does this add it? Questions are getting harder, huh? Or you're thinking about fallout. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do we have a foreign key now? No, we don't. No. All right. for, for one thing, for one thing, not to pick on you, but I've had you in a few classes. I think I think you know that I don't mean any harm. There's no such thing in database terms as a like kind of a foreign key. All right, <laughs> you know, like well, yeah, some of the times it'll enforce referential integrity. Other times, yeah, I'll just let it slide if I'm having a tough day. You know, so the answer is no. Really, what you need to do is click that in, in, enforce referential integrity. And that's what makes it a primary key. Almost when you click the Gibbs little Yeah, that's right. See, it was almost, though. You're right. Yeah, it was almost. Let's see, one checkbox. Right. <laughs> All right. And then I'm not going to cascade because let's say I decide to do away with advanced intermediate. I get rid of that code because it's like, you know, that doesn't really make sense. What, what the heck's an advanced intermediate either? You know, pick a side. Either you're advanced or you're intermediate. All right. Well, I wouldn't want to delete everyone that shows advanced intermediate. Right? That, that wouldn't seem fair. So I'm not going to cascade delete. And updates, because I'm using an auto number key, is irrelevant. So here I'm set. Now, if you notice, I did not make that field required. All right? Notice it's automatically indexed because I made it a foreign key. All right, so that part it did for me. But I didn't make it required. Why did I not make it required? Well, one, maybe it really is not a required field. Maybe, maybe you don't have to define your skill level when you go into this um, page. There's another reason, though. I already have data in the table. So I can't make it required. And it tells me, no, nah, can't do that. So I can say no. I don't want to make that change. I can then go in and manually give those people a skill level. And now that they have a skill level, I can go in and say it's required. <laughs> I was wondering if anyone would notice that. <laughs> okay, it's asking me the same thing because it, it knows it could have a problem. All right, it doesn't go and actually analyze it until I say yes, I want to analyze it. And eh, it was okay with it this time because now I did it. How do I want to say it? This is a reason why you want to make sure you have your database solid before you enter data in it, right? Because you don't want to add constraints after you have data in it. If you have to, you have to. But remember the famous curve of the further along you go in the project, the more expensive it 
is to make the change. All right, the more expensive it is to make the change. So if you're planning something, all right, and you decide I want to make this field required, how long does that take to change? Well, it took two seconds to click the required button. If I have a database table with 10,000 rows in it, and I want to make a new field required, I can't do that because none of the 10,000 have a value for that. So I'm going to have to figure out a way to put that in, write some routine to populate it somehow, maybe put a message up that says we have a new update that gives you a skill level. For simplicity, we have made everyone an intermediate. Please go in and alter your skill level as appropriate. Well, how much harder is that to do than just getting it right in the first place? Okay. So now we have this. And again, now we can't put in a skill level that doesn't exist in the skill level table. Now, sometimes people are concerned and say, well, when I look at the player, I see the skill level ID. I wish I could see the description of that. And that's fair, all right? And you could go and do that in Access and make it so that it shows a drop down and a look up and all that. But keep in mind, fundamentally it's displaying, or I'm sorry, fundamentally it's storing the actual ID. So I typically wouldn't do that in Access. That's an Access thing. Right? In my code, in my application, I'm going to go and change it to do, uh, use a drop down. But again, I wouldn't necessarily go and do that here. Yes? Would that um, apply to like a form? Yeah. Change it, it into the description? It, I mean, it, would, it, would, it would apply to a form that you designed in Access. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't apply to a form that you did within uh, Could you just kind of, um, that was the question I had during lab then. What's that? How to make okay. this that's, form. That's exactly what we're going to do now. Oh, okay, okay. All right. So, how to go and make that a form. First of all, let's go and just put that field on there to begin with. And we'll put it in following the default rules. What is it that I have to change here? Because I've added a new field. Well, it would make sense I have to change it in two places, whatever I have to do. It's going to happen in two places, right? I need to change the data source to use, to be able to pull that value out of the database and to um, update it. And then I'm going to need to change the visual control to show the value of that field. First, we're going to show it in a text box, then we're going to show it in a drop down. So, let's go and add it to the data source. That says select star from player. We don't have to change that. All right? Because now select star includes that new column as well. So, I could go here and I can go and add to this, comma. Skill level ID equals question mark. <coughs> this is a question that can be confusing. And I have to say that I don't always get it right. All right. The idea is, is it knows you change something with regards to the um, with regards to the um, SQL data source. Therefore, it's 
asking me if I want to reset that details view. If I say yes, it's going to go and undo all the work that I've custom did before. All right. Um, if I answer no, then it will leave it to me and I can go in and continue. A lot of it depends on how much custom work I've done before and the kind of change that I'm making. If I'm adding a lot of new columns and a lot of new tables and so on and so forth, I probably will say, yeah, go ahead and reset it. Unless I've done a lot of custom work on it that I don't want to lose. In this case, I think we're safe because the original SQL statement was select star from such and such. So I'm going to say no. Now, if it doesn't work, I'm going to go here and say refresh schema. And that will go and redo that. So, I'm going to go here and edit. And I'm going to go and notice that I have these fields that are in the form. Notice that the fields that are available are the user password. So I can, um, I'm sorry, uh, includes the user password, but it includes the skill level ID. So I can add that to my form. And I can put it wherever I want to on the form. Let's put it after email. Okay. And there it is. I go and run this. And I get this goofy error. All right. Now, two possibilities. I could go in and look at the code and look at the properties and try to figure out what's going wrong. Or I can go in here and say refresh schema. I think what's wrong is I need to put default view there. seen this there before, but it's been a while. So, ah, right here it's saying that instead of dynamic field, it should say bound field. So, I'm going to go in the code and Notice that says dynamic field, I'll change it to bound field. And might I say I would never see that problem if I was looking at the GUI. If I would have looked directly to that code, I'll, it's possible depending on what kind of day I'm having today, that I would have known that without Googling it. Because I would have looked and said, well, gee, why does it break when I put that in? Hmm, all the rest of them are bound columns. This one says dynamic column. All right, so let's give this a shot.
And there we go. And But notice that that's in a text box, which, boom. this by putting a drop down on here. Alright? So how do I make it so that there's a drop down? Well, again, first thing you do is you think this is different than the default. This is not the default behavior. This is um, custom code that we're going to change the way the default acts. Therefore, that tells you that this needs to be a template column. Alright? So, Notice my SQL statement, by the way. I'm not pulling anything from, I'm not pulling the description from the skill level table. Updates and everything go a lot smoother if everything is just pulled from one table. Then it never gets confused about what table it needs to update. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to say edit, edit fields. I'll pick my skill level and I'm going to say convert this field into a template field. Okay, so now skill level is a template field, and I can edit templates. All right, so edit item template is what I want to change, right? How do I want to change it? I'm going to get rid of the text box. All right, I'm going to go and add a SQL data source. What is the SQL data source going to give me? Option to pull in the data. All right, it's going to pull in the data for from that table. Yes. And then you can pull it with a drop down. Yep. I'm just making it. Is that in the wrong spot that you need to go down? I, I think it is. I'm going to try to get rid of it. Configure data source. What connection? My connection. What do I want to have? I want to have, let's use the GUI for this. I want to see the skill level ID, description. Do I want to see the sequence code? No. no. Will I use the sequence code? Sure. Yes. All right. Is there a where clause on here? Yes. Will that be a where clause though? What's the where clause do? It limits what you're seeing. Do I want to see only some of the skill levels in this drop down or all of them? All of them. So no where clause. Order by clause on the other hand, absolutely. I want to see by skill level and probably ascending, right? Makes sense. Advanced is, I can generate insert, update, and delete statements. But we're not doing any of that right now in this table, so we don't need to do that. Pardon me? It's skill level, is that the, that's not the name. What is not the name? Skill level. That's, skill level ID is how they came in, right? Uh, I'm not following the question. I'm, I'm trying to understand what you're ordering by. You're ordering by skill level, and that's the ID when we no, I'm, I'm, I'm ordering by sequence code. Oh, my mistake. I'm ordering by sequence code. I do too much, but right. Practice. Yeah, I, I clicked the wrong one. Good, good, good catch. All right. So now I go next test query. It shows it to me in the proper order, which is neither alphabetic nor in key order, but that order that I decided, and finish. So now I can go in and edit the template.
four skill level and I can drag a drop down over here. All right. Now, there's two things that we need to set. And this, this is a little confusing, so I'll try to go over it um, in a way that will help you understand. First thing we have is a data source. What do you suppose the data source is going to be? Well, it's going to be the one we just created, but what does that determine? That determines a list of items that are going to be in this dropdown. So that SQL statement is going to retrieve all of the skill levels, and that's what's going to be used to populate this dropdown. So I select the data source, data source 2. The field I want to display is I want to display the description. Right? I don't want to display the skill ID because the skill ID would be like one, two, four, three. And I have no idea what that means. All right, so I want to display the description. What value do I want behind the scenes? What's the value? In other words, what do I need to use to store in the database? I need the actual ID. So again, this is getting back to drop downs and, and when I had some of you folks in 2.16 and we talked about drop downs, I said there's what the user sees then what's stored behind the scenes that the script is going to see. And what the script needs to see is the actual skill level because that skill level is what we put into the database. All right. So the data source determines what options are available in the drop down. The data bindings determines where that's going to go in the database. So, I edit data bindings. The selected value is going to go in the skill level ID in the player table. So, data source is, how is my list formed? How do I get my options? The data bindings is, once I've selected my option, where do I put the value of that? and I put that in the skill level ID. Two-way binding is going to be checked in nearly all cases. What two-way binding is, is it will bind it going in, it will bind it going out. In other words, when I first pull it up, it's going to show the right skill level. And after I update it, it's going to take that skill level and update the database. So as far as displaying and updating, this column is bound or this, this visual control is bound to that column in the database. All right. Okay. Run this. And let's see what we get. All right, there we go. Notice my skill level shows it's advanced, all right? Which is what it should be, right? Because my value was three. Now I go in here and I change that to intermediate advanced and I click update and I get an error, all right? So, how are we gonna debug this? Data type mismatch in criteria expression. Go and look at this.
need to put that in the right order. Oh. Where'd I put it? I put it before user ID? After email. After email. Let's try that. There's actually a style of programming, and the name of it is ridiculous, but um, it kind of makes sense. I don't know. Is this interesting? It's called extreme programming, which, you know, it's like everything was extreme a few years back, right? In extreme programming, you have two people programming at all times. One person's taking the wheel and coding, and the other person is looking over their shoulder. And it's just for those things like that, all right? Uh, you can imagine the time savings it would take to go in and have a second set of eyes as you're putting the code in. I've never worked in that environment. I don't know. I mean, if you think about it, that's doubling. You better double that programmer's productivity because you now have two programmers working on on it within one. And if it does, then, then it's worth it. I don't know. All right, and it worked. So, there's one thing that we have not seen yet, and that's the update parameters. And with the update parameters, you can do a better job associating it. But apparently, in the update statement needs to be in the same order as the select statement would be. Okay. Now, what we're going to cover next time. We still have two things that I don't like about this, all right? The one thing I don't like about this is that it's sort of dumb after I click update, it stays there. It should probably send me somewhere else so I can do other stuff. That's one thing I don't like. The second thing I don't like is I have not addressed the issue of duplicate user IDs. So if I were to go and put my user ID of DH right now and try to do an update, it's going to explode. Now that's not something we can easily solve with a drop down, all right, or a validator. So what we're going to do is we're going to let that error happen and we're just going to handle it more gracefully, all right. That's one of your choices when you talk about handling errors is that, hey, I can prevent the error from happening by designing my form, or I can write some validation code or use a validation control, or I can let the error blow up and just be there to clean up the mess. So we'll address those two things next time. And the good thing is, is that what we're talking about for updates, inserts and deletes have just about the same sort of thing associated with them. Uh, in addition to that, Data grids and detail, or grid views and detail views, uh, work about the same. So, therefore, um, what I'm saying about detail views, um, as far as updating and all that goes, you can do the identical things in grid views. All right. So, um, we'll see you in a while.